Good morning. Whoa. Whoa. That'll wake you up. Good morning and welcome to worship with Augusta Heights Baptist Church. Glad that you are here, uh, whether you are here in person or here with us watching online. Thank you for making time to be a part of this worship service. Uh, Jeff Corbett is going to be handing out some info that you're going to need in just a second, about one per family. Um, this is just our nominating committee's report that we'll be getting to in just a moment. Uh, but let me also say, if you're a visitor with us, a special welcome to you. Glad to have you here, and especially if this is one of your first few times with us, uh, we would love for you to fill out a visitor's card. Those are in the pews in front of you in the little pockets. You can drop it in one of the uh, white offering boxes up here at the front or in the vestibule as you leave. Hopefully you will have filled it out before you put it in there. Uh, but we just want to know your name, and we want to be available to be of service in any way that we can. But most of all, let us just say thank you so much for being here with us. I'll also say uh, this is Promotion Sunday. We had a great uh, uh, time, a great parents meeting, and kids moving up to new classes. Uh, but it's also a good reminder we do have um, worship care for babies all the way through preschool. So um, if your kid is five or under and you uh, want to have a lot more fun than sitting in here quietly and listening to people talk, um, then there is a wonderful, caring environment, fun environment for them uh, just down the hall here. And if after the children's sermon, if they just want to go with the rest of the kids, uh, that they're more than welcome to do that. We also have worship bags uh, with different activities and ways to stay engaged in the worship service. 
in the back as well. Um, so again, would love to uh, be of support to your family and your kids in any way that we can. Um, this is Promotion Sunday, but we're also having a back-to-school movie by the pool this evening from 6 to about probably 8.30 or 9. This is at Gary Green's house. You see information uh, in your or on your worship bulletin about that. We also have information about an upcoming golf tournament. Uh, we also have information about an upcoming Habitat Build project. So would love to have you join us for any or all of those. Let us know if you have questions or need other info, but there are also links on there people you can reach out to. One announcement not printed is that our ball club, this is our senior adult ministry and group, uh, ball stands for Be Active, Live Longer, will be getting together for lunch on Tuesday at 1130 at the Olive Garden at the corner of Lawrence and Verde. So if you'd like to uh, take part in that, join in that, you can let us know at the church office or you can just show up. We'll always make room for you there. Uh, we have had our renovations continue. Uh, some of you parents got to walk back and see the, the children's area and how that is progressing along as well. Uh, our property to be sold, the portion of our property to be sold is back under contract. We are excited about that. Everything is moving along. Uh, but I will also remind you, if you've pledged, we'd love to get those in as quickly as possible. That actually helps us. It saves us money by getting in those pledges sooner um, by decreasing the interest that we have to pay through our financing. And if you haven't pledged yet, or if you're just wondering, what is he talking about? Uh, let me know. I'd be happy to let you know about what our plans are, uh, the work that we've done, show you around, um, and perhaps you might want the opportunity to support that good work as well. As we mentioned, our nominating committee has completed their work and recruited a slate of committee members and ministry team leaders for this year. Uh, these were mailed and emailed out this past week, officially presented now, so I'll invite Mandy to come up to give you a quick rundown of what's there. Morning. 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 Uh, the nominating committee has been working diligently for a couple of months now to find willing and able individuals to serve as deacons and to serve on our committees and teams. Um, the members of the nominating committee are Lynn Fox, Addie Cass, Brian Davis, Donna Bowling, Dick Carson, and myself. Um, just for a little bit of explanation um, beyond what's printed in front of you. Um, we do have nine deacons that serve, um, three rotating on and three rotating off each year. Um, our four committees include Commission and Outreach, Stewardship and Finance, Personnel, and Building and Property. These committees have six members, with two members rotating off and on each year. Um, deacons and these committees are all three-year terms. Um, the areas of fellowship, children's ministry, greeting, come down, and youth ministry um, our teams that we've identified, and there's two to three leaders on each team, and that's just a one-year term. These individuals will work with many other volunteers to identify and complete work at the work at hand. Um, if you have interest in volunteering, especially for the teens, um, please let Greg or the team members know because they definitely will be interested in having help from outside of just the individuals listed. We did ensure this year that each deacon serves on a team or committee. This really helps to make sure that the work of each team or committee is ad adequately communicated to the deacons and helps move the vision of the church forward as a whole so that everybody's kind of in the, in the loop about what's going on. Um, so this, the, the slate in front of you has already been approved by our current deacons. I can ask, are there any additional nominations from the floor, keeping in mind that you need to have gotten permission from the person that you want to nominate. <laughs> so do we have any of those? All right, if not, um, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you. So that's the official presentation, and we will have our official vote to approve this slate of nominees next week at the beginning of our worship service. And thanks to the nominating committee for all that they have done. I will also call your uh, attention to the prayer concerns and celebrations printed at the back of your um, bulletin, uh, particularly the family of Margie Montgomery, uh, a church member for over 50 years who passed away and whose funeral was 
just a few days ago. Um, but on the more positive side of things, I get the privilege of sharing with you that we get to celebrate with Andrew and Amanda Faust, who are expecting in February, and we are very excited for them. So we not only celebrate, but offer our continued prayers for, for health and wellness and, um, and excitement and celebration as they look forward to adding to their family. Uh, we are not going to have the choir sing this morning. With the parent meeting and the tour, there was just a lot going on, and we didn't have a chance to rehearse. So we're going to give them a break, and so I'll just go ahead and invite Dustin Cash to come up and open us with a word of prayer as we begin in worship. Let us worship together. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many ways you have given us blessings. Thank you for the lives that have been changed, the unity that has been brought together, and the hope that has been given to us. As we gather in your presence today, we lift our hearts in gratitude for the gift of a new school year filled with opportunities and possibilities. We pray for the children who are beginning this new chapter in their lives. May your love surround them, providing them with strength, wisdom, and a hunger for knowledge. We also lift up the teachers, educators, and mentors who will walk alongside our children, bless their efforts to inspire curiosity, install values, and foster a love for learning in those they teach. As we embark on this new academic year, we place it all into your hands, knowing that you are the ultimate source of wisdom and guidance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing our opening hymn. It's number 44, For the Beauty of the Earth, and we will do verses 1 through 3 and 6. with me a backpack why in the world do you think miss gail would have a backpack <laughs> going back to school so are y'all excited about that I Go 
smooth. See when I started already. <laughs> okay, we're excited about school. I think probably some of you might be a little bit nervous too. Um, who's going to a new school this year? Raise your hand. Yeah, who's going into kindergarten? Yeah, and who's, do we have anyone going into middle school? Oh, they've already left me. <laughs> You're going into middle school? Great, great. And it's, I know some others that are back there. Well, I want to show you um, one thing I have in my backpack here. I was out shopping for my grandson for his school supplies, and um, I got these pencils. And you know what? They reminded me of you because look at these pencils. They are so colorful, right? Um, and you know what? I know y'all have some colorful personalities. <laughs> I already know that. I have learned that some beautiful personalities that are all loved by God, right? And I also know that you are all different. And you notice that here, all of these are different colors, right? I know as well as you know that we all have different color skins. We have friends with different color skins. We have friends that have different personalities. We have friends who some of them like soccer, some of them like dance, some of them like football better than basketball. All of those kinds of things make us different. But are we all still children of God? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the other thing I thought about when I looked at these color pencils is, you see, they all have little lead, and this one is red, the color red on the outside. And so that means if um, I take this, What's it, what color is it going to come out if I mark it down? Red. It's going to come out red. Well, the thing about the lead, I think, it reminded me that all of us make a mark in our lives. When you go to school, when you make marks, not marks like um, marks that you get like A's, B's, C's, and D's, but the way we mark ourselves with different friends and the way we act is how we mark ourselves. The way we are like Jesus, maybe, and help others in school, the things that we do, like sitting together, like our friends over there that are taking care of each other, and that's what the mark is the mark of the color. So that reminded me of all of you. And then I have something else that I want to share with you. It's a tag, and it's going to be for your book bag, your backpack. And it's little, and it can go. You can put them right on here. But I want to tell you what it says. And I want to be sure you know this very one thing. It says on here, this backpack has been blessed by Augusta Heights Baptist Church, who wants you to know how much we love you, that we're going to pray for you, and we're going to support you. And that means everyone out there is making that pledge to do that because we love you, because you are part of God's great big world. And there's a scripture that I want to leave you with, and it's on the back of your tag for you to see. It says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. I bet you know the rest of it. For who is with you always? Who is with us always? is with us always. And that's from the book of Joshua in our Bible. I'm going to read it one more time. Then I'm going to have a prayer. And then I'm going to have y'all come up to my book bag. And I have something special for you. 
I have a box of the colored pencils, and attached to that is the backpack tag. So you can take that with you. And remember that always you have the support and the love of your church family. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for all of these children who have gathered today in this family, church family that supports them as they start their new year at school. Some may have already started, but most will begin on Tuesday. And our prayers as a church family are with them, and we certainly know that you are with them also. For we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. stand and sing together once again our next hymn. It's number 507. Would you bless our homes and families? We'll do verses 1, 3, and 4. said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you for seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. And they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave him his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? 
Laban said, This is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. Laban gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her maid. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. He served Laban for another seven years. Elena, I'll invite you to go ahead and come up if you don't mind, because uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, and then, and then she'll sing for us. I will also say, um, kids, if you want to listen for kind of your, your clue words or count how many times I say something, if you get the number, so I'm going to say titles of Taylor Swift songs <laughs> in the sermon. And if you correctly count the number of titles that I say in the sermon, uh, then you'll get a treat next week. You'll just have to let me know what your number is um, when uh, after the service. Um, when you're ready. Hey guys. So guess who goes back to school on Friday? <laughs> I'm going back to college. I'm so excited. My mom, not as much, but I'm excited. So please give her a big hug and kiss because she's 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 crying back there. So please, please give her a big old hug and kiss. But also, um, I'm having my first ever show, my solo show on Tuesday at Blues Boulevard in downtown Greenville. If you guys want to get tickets and come and see me sing, me sing there. Um, I know you guys are probably tired of hearing me sing because I do it all the time, but. Um, if you guys want to come and see me sing a couple songy songs, that would be really cool. I'd love to see you guys there since this is my last Sunday. I'm going to miss you guys a lot because you guys are my family and I talk about you all the time. So let me start singing before I start crying. I'm going to get you. If you wouldn't mind, grab a seat for just a second. Grab a seat? And Sorry, you. guys. You're good. Not my moment. You're good. It is my moment. Okay. I'll get I'm going to. I'm going to set you up for this song so well. Oh, okay. I'm, so ready. Well. I'm so ready. I'm so ready. All good. All good. Um, all right. Taylor Swift song titles. Y'all are on it. Um, so you heard the scripture, right? Did you hear the scripture? Because anyone who says that we should hold to the biblical definition of marriage did not hear this scripture. <laughs> Two sisters who marry their cousin producing 12 sons and one daughter between the two of them and two of their female slaves. You know, we often take the Bible so seriously, we forget that sometimes it gives us a story like this. Racy and raunchy and sounding more like material for the tabloids or some weird Netflix documentary about a family cult. So let's review just one more time. Jacob is looking for a wife. He meets Rachel, his cousin, and bargains with his uncle Laban to marry her after working for his uncle for seven years, which he does. And it seemed to him but a few days. On the wedding night, though, Laban gets Jacob so inebriated that he doesn't realize his uncle has made the other daughter, also Jacob's cousin, Leah, consummate the marriage instead of Rachel. Jacob wakes up with a splitting headache, I'm sure, and in one of the great understatements of Scripture, we read, when morning came, it was Leah. <laughs> Jacob confronts Laban for tricking him, talk about the pot calling the kettle black, and, Jacob, and gets Jacob to agree to work for him for another seven years, to be able to marry Rachel, which he was trying to do in the first place. Jacob does the work for seven years again, and they are finally married. Fun fact, this kind of swap the bride at night trick is what has led to the tradition of brides lifting their veil during a wedding ceremony so the groom can make sure he's got the right woman. <laughs> this is a rollicking good tale, fun to follow, especially since the con artist Jacob himself gets conned. Jacob, our anti-hero who's been doing plenty of his own vigilante stuff, knows all too well the bad blood that he's created with others. But in this love story with Rachel, never in his wildest dreams would he imagine that karma 
would track him down. In fact, this is the only time that someone seems to get the best of Jacob when he gets a taste of his own medicine. And maybe that's why we get a glimpse of Jacob's goodness, too. This entire 14-year episode we read about is, in a way, a redemptive experience for Jacob. Because it's the first time, maybe the only time, when we see him care this much about anyone or anything other than himself. And we see in 14 years of service, which seemed to him but a few days because of his love for Rachel, we see just how far he is willing to go, just what he is willing to do for love. Word. <laughs> I'm not going to guess because I know how many it is. I'm not going to guess. Jacob humming that 70s Yacht Rock classic <laughs> as he's working for 14 years, right? People wondering, what is wrong with this guy that he's willing to go this far and do this much for his love? And it is impressive, you got to admit, if not somewhat endearing, what Jacob does do. But as it is with most of this storyline, that's from Jacob's perspective. It focuses on him, and because of that, it's easy to forget about Rachel and Leah. 
In my mind, these two women are the most fascinating characters in this story. We usually speak of them as a pair, Rachel and Leah, Leah and Rachel. But the way they get framed in the story is as foils to one another. They're set over against each other, and they are, as the story plays out. Even the ways in which they're described, the ways the story's told, seems to highlight these contrasts between them. One is the elder, one is the younger. One is described as graceful and beautiful. The other, depending on the translation, is having lovely eyes, or some say weak eyes. Maybe meaning that she wasn't that much to look at. One who longed to be desired, the other who was desired greatly. One who would become a mother to many children, the other who struggled to be. These contrasts and the competition and the conflict they create run throughout these women's stories for chapters and chapters after this too. For instance, in the next chapter we read that Rachel envied her sister Leah. And Rachel says, with mighty wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and prevailed. It's a fight. Leah accuses Rachel of stealing her husband and then accuses Rachel of trying to steal her son's mandrakes. I'm not even sure what that is, but she was mad about it. (laughs) The two women are practically racing one another to bear Jacob's children, competing for his affections. The rivalry, the conflict is real. And yet so much of this conflict is not because of their differences, but because other people in their lives manipulate those differences. They use those differences to pit these women against each other. Their father does it, their husband, and later, to a certain extent, their own children. It's a toxic pattern in systems of relationships called triangulation. When one person or party in the relationship brings another person into the mix, usually so that first person can maintain some kind of control and influence over both. The other two people will rarely communicate with one another, and certainly not in any kind of healthy way, because it's all about playing the two against each other. You've got Jacob, and then you've got Rachel and Leah. It's what Laban did. It's what Jacob does. It's a way of preying on the longings and the wounds of other people, the brokenness or the insecurities of other people in order to make yourself feel better. And it creates conflict and unhealthy relationships and toxic patterns just like we see play out in the lives of Rachel and Leah. These women, these sisters, are at odds with one another. Not because they are simply different from one another, but because somebody else has manipulated them. More importantly, manipulated their hurts and their heartbreaks, their longings and their desires, the ways that they may have felt they were incomplete or lacking. And it can happen to us too. Especially when we can't be honest, even with ourselves, we often end up being used or hurt or hurting and using others, or falling into these toxic patterns of relationships. All because maybe we have not named and addressed those areas of brokenness or longing within ourselves. We operate often subconsciously and unthinkingly from our most profound fears and our deepest longings, and we create all kinds of unhealth, even with the people we love along the way. You know who is the absolute worst about doing this? Families. You know who's a close second? Churches. And yet, if we can be aware enough of our own wounds, of our own insecurities, that we do not allow ourselves to be played into the manipulations of others, or worse yet, cause even more pain to others, we can find healing, not only for ourselves, but also in our relationships and in our communities. I remember hearing about a deeply troubled church that could not keep a pastor. 
Eight pastors had come and gone in 11 years. All of them at the request of the congregation, mostly after conflict of some sort or another with one of the longtime members in particular. So the bishop called a special meeting of several key leaders from the congregation, as well as a couple dozen randomly chosen clergy and lay people from other churches in their local conference. Once the situation was presented, after everybody had had a chance to offer some input and insight, the bishop said in his best preacher voice, Brothers and sisters, what are we to do? Whom shall we send to this congregation? And he invited everybody to pray silently, seeking discernment and guidance and maybe a prompt to volunteer to go from the Holy Spirit. The silence lasted a long time, even long after the bishop concluded with a resolute and disappointed, Amen. But in the silence that followed, at last, one of the older pastors from the back of the room spoke out, I'll go, she said. As people looked back to see who had spoken, there was a collective gasp and then the buzz of hushed conversation because everybody knew about Deborah, that she'd been on leave for the past couple of years, that she'd left her last church in the wake of a scandalous divorce, that she was an alcoholic, twice convicted of drunk driving. She'd spent time shortly in prison, longer in rehab. But since she was so near retirement and in consideration of her long time of faithful service and the progress that she had made in her recovery, she'd been allowed to keep her credentials. The bishop had hoped that he could place her in some small, quiet, caring congregation where she could serve out her remaining years without a whole lot of stress. Are you sure, Deborah? The bishop asked. This is a congregation in pain, she said. And I know something about pain, so I should be the one to go. Deborah and the bishop met with several of the leaders of the troubled congregation, and the congregation agreed to accept her as their pastor. But in that meeting, Deborah told them, I intend to visit with every member of this church before I perform any other pastoral duties, including preaching. I will not lead in worship. I will not attend any meetings until that task is completed So I will let you know when I'm done and when I'm ready to preach. And over the next month, she went from house to house, from hospital to nursing home bed, introducing herself as the new pastor and asking each person to respond to two questions. How did you come to love Jesus? And why have you chosen to serve him in this congregation? Morning, noon, and night for four and a half weeks, She visited and was received by every member of the congregation, except one. He simply would not meet with her. Finally, she called the lay leaders together and told them, I think I'm ready to preach. And the following Sunday, the sanctuary was packed with almost every member who was able to be there. She told them, I have two things to share with you today, how I came to love Jesus. And why I believe God has called me to serve him with you in this congregation. She preached a beautiful and moving sermon. And as she closed, just as she was about to ask everyone to join with her in prayer, a man stood up towards the back of the sanctuary and shouted out. It was Harry Wearson, the one who refused to see her. The one who had bedeviled so many pastors before her. Some of the other members had told Deborah in their visits that Harry had never really recovered from his wife's death many years before. That he was still in deep pain and deep grief over that loss. He stood up at the back and said, Who do you think you are, sister? Glaring at her, his face was red, his knuckles were white from gripping the back of the pew in front of him. We know all about you. You couldn't keep your husband." You're a drunk. You're the last thing we need at this church. We got enough problems as it is. Deborah looked at him with sad eyes. He didn't speak. For seconds that felt like minutes, he could have heard a pin drop. She finally said, I am a broken person, Harry. A person who is broken. 
but it's found healing. And I've come to serve with broken people. With broken people who are looking for healing. And then she stepped down from the pulpit and walked down the long center aisle back to where Harry was standing, still gripping that pew. And she put her hand on his shoulder and looked him in the eye and said, I am so sorry about Mildred. She must have been very dear to you. And Harry let go of the pew and fell into her arms, sobbing. After a moment, Deborah invited everyone else in the congregation to gather around them as they joined hands and she led them in prayer. And when she said, Amen, she was aware of something around her that felt like a collective sigh of relief. It was like they'd all, in their own ways and together, found that healing that they had so desperately been looking for. Deborah went on to serve with that congregation for 12 years, finally retiring at the age of 74. And just before he died, Harry Wearsome told her that she had been an answer to his prayer. Now, I rarely preach practical sermons. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> I'm usually not directive in my sermons. I usually don't tell you what you need to do. I like to leave y'all with hopefully a meaningful and inspiring message and then let you figure out for yourselves what you are being called to do. Not today. Here's what you can do. Here's what we can all do. Communicate well. Talk to people. Don't talk about people to other people. Be kind and be honest, both of those together, with yourself and with others. Cultivate emotional intelligence. Be self-aware. Try to understand your emotions and your motivations for what you do and what you say. Name, if only for yourself, the hurts and the pains, the hoped-for possibilities and the yearnings of your heart, the wounds that you've experienced, the insecurities that you wrestle with, and do your best to recognize the ways that these can affect your actions and your relationships. Go to therapy. That's it. Just go to therapy. That's the advice. Find, can I get an amen? amen. Yeah. <laughs> Find a mental health professional or a counselor. Do the work that it requires to be the healthiest version of yourself, to be the most faithful version of yourself, to who God created you to be. To be honest, that's what I am trying to do with my counselor, and I can tell you it is work. It's a lot easier to go through life never having to ask why we do what we do. Unaware, blissfully unaware of our underlying emotions and motivations and how our past experiences and pain might be affecting our present interactions. <clears throat> Left to our own devices or going through life on a kind of emotional autopilot, we will remain wounded and broken. And there's going to be a lot bigger chance that we will wound and hurt others. Unable to find a way to move from where we are to where we want to be. To where God calls us to be. To who God calls us to be living out of well-being and wholeness, healing and hope, and offering the same to others. If we are willing, though, to admit our deepest hurts and hopes, if we're honest about our brokenness and our insecurities with ourselves and maybe even with each other, then we might just find that we can be broken together. And perhaps by God's grace, we can find healing together, too.
And in the process, we might just find what we all too often forget. What Rachel and Leah forgot. That first and foremost, above all else, we are family. Sisters and brothers, siblings, bound together as the children of God. by Melody Powell. We are sisters, born first, born second, to, to the, the same, same mother, to the same father, different yet similar mm -hmm. in so many ways. We have strengths, independence, intelligence, beauty. We have weaknesses, pride, anger, jealousy. We love, we hate. We attempt to do our best. We succumb to our frailties. We fight. We make amends. We are human. Strong. Weak. Unsure. Confident. We, we are, are opposites, opposites, yet we are similar. We are two, yet we are one. One womb. One bloodline. One family. We agree. We argue. We, we question. question. Life throws us different challenges. Provides us with different opportunities. We meet some with dignity. We meet some with despair. We are human. We are worthy. We are unworthy. No matter what. No matter what. We, we are loved by God. God. We are sisters. If 
for honest It would change our lives It would set us free It's what we need to be So bring your brokenness and I'll bring mine Cause love can heal what hurt divides And mercy's waiting on the other side If we're honest If we're honest, if we're If we can be honest with ourselves, perhaps we can admit the ways in which we are wounded, and in doing so, find healing. And if you have found a place of healing and wholeness in this community of faith, we invite you to be a part of it, or to take the next step in your journey of faith, whatever that may mean for you. So if you'd like to respond to that invitation, I'll be here at the front to greet you and speak with you as we stand and sing our closing hymn, number 387, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. just a moment and let me invite y'all to come and stand here with us hey this is russell and zoe harrison and abbott and phoebe and gus and uh they have already jumped right into the life of the church um with bible study with um being with the kids on sunday morning and i feel like they have found a place here where they can you want to say hey to everybody hi um where they can uh, grow together, but also share life together with you and walk this journey of life and faith together. So if you will welcome them into this fellowship 
and uh, pledge yourself to walk alongside them in that journey of life and faith, will you please affirm that by saying, Amen. 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 We're so glad that y'all are here with us. Grab a seat right here. I'll get you to fill out an information card. We'll get a picture. But I also hope after the service uh, that you'll come forward to uh, greet them, to welcome them, uh, to introduce yourselves if you haven't already, and continue that process of uh, being bound together in this community of love and faith. We also are going out into a big week for a lot of our students and parents and teachers. I know the kids with the children's sermon got uh, tags for their book bags, but you know, if you're a youth and you're just way too cool for that, um, or if you're a teacher, or if you're a parent and you want a way to remember uh, this community is praying for you and encouraging you and has blessed you, uh, we have buttons up here that you can put on a computer bag or a backpack or whatever you'd like um, with our little AH logo. Uh, and it says on them, Beloved, be loved, and be loved. A reminder that you are all, we are all, beloved children of God. And so to live in that love, but also to live out that love with others. So let me offer a blessing for our parents and teachers and students who are starting this year, and then we'll close with our benediction. As we begin another school year, we ask God's blessings upon our parents and teachers and students, that they would learn to love learning, for we know that the world is God's and all things in it, each in their own way, speak to God's presence and purposes. That teachers would be passionate about their subjects and compassionate with their students. That God would give fresh insights and inspiration and epiphanies to all as each learns more and more of who God is and grows more and more into who God would have us to be. That all would be in their school community, and even in small ways, bearers of light and love. And most of all, that they would come to know that they are never alone. We are never alone and are always, always loved. So as we go from this time of worship into a new school year or simply into the week ahead, we pray that God would give us all grace. Grace never to sell ourselves short. Grace to risk something big or something good. Grace to remember that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth, and too small for anything but love. So may God take our minds and think through them. May God take our lips and speak through them. May God take our hands and work through them. And may God take our hearts and set them on fire this day every day, and forever be. Amen. Go in peace.